I took quite a lot as a kid, to be honest. I used to get kicked a lot. Parents would shout at me all the time, like, kick that girl. And when I was 12, a boy broke my elbow on my first day of senior school just because he was calling his names for playing football. It's really rare that we're actually joined by actual royalty on the show, but it's not only hello to the Queen of the Pitch, it's hello to Queen of the Jungle. Jill, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Very good. Currently in Australia, but yeah, I'm doing very well. And thank you for having me on the podcast. Oh my God, I'm so excited to have you. And I mean, it must be so weird for you right now to have actually taken a step back from football and having to sit there and watch the World Cup and not be playing. <laughs> is it more stressful to watch it and not be able to do anything? Or is it better to be in the pressure cooker of the team? The last game, just kicking every single ball with them. And yeah, the next day I felt like I'd actually played a game of football. So yeah, but it's just because you care, isn't it? It's like, it's your teammates, it's your family, um, and you just care about them so much. At least then you don't have to do a cardio workout at the end of the day. Just watching football's doing it for you now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm using that excuse as well. I was meant to go for a run the day after and I ended up falling asleep for an hour. I was like, this is embarrassing, but I don't have to do that anymore now. I, I, I try to, but I don't have to. One of the most iconic moments of your career is, of course, the Euros. I mean, what a time to be alive that was. England won in front of a 90,000 strong crowd at Wembley Stadium, record audiences watching women's football. And it was such a huge moment for women's sport, full stop. I was there, I literally lost my mind watching it. Were there points in your career where you felt like that was completely impossible? Oh yeah, completely. I remember 2009 playing in the Euros final against Germany and we actually got beat 6-2. We were nowhere near the level of Germany. We weren't playing full-time football back in England. So I think if I look at that moment, I thought, when will the time ever come that we'll defeat these kind of teams? And yeah, doing it at Wembley, 90,000 people. There was just so many kind of ticks that day, like just so many girls and boys watching the Lionesses, mm. um, the crowd actually finally getting that gold medal. But it's kind of, it's so hard to put into words because it literally was the best day of any of our lives. Hopefully the girls can go and win the World Cup. But yeah, it was just the best day of my life and one that I'll treasure forever. Like, what do you think that win really symbolises and really stands for? I think it probably stands for just anybody in any job, any young person, any person that's doing anything. Just don't give up on that dream. Like, you have to trust the process. And sometimes there's days where you just want to throw the towel in. There's so many more losses than wins. And even in work in general, when you, you're going for this goal and you just think, are we ever going to get there? Are you Are trying to hit this target? You put everything into it. You sacrifice time with your family, time with your friends, because it just means so much to you. But I hope that that day can just represent don't give up on your dreams because I always say when everything's trying to pull you back, it's a bit like a bow and arrow and you feel like you want to give up. I feel like that's when that pressure is going to take you to the next level. So I hope it can stand for that. I, I really do. It definitely stands for that. And you had so much fun in the process of getting that European yeah. Championships. What was kind of like the behind the scenes moment that you will never forget from the Euros? I don't know if there's many I can share on a podcast, but uh, <laughs> in tournaments, people only see you for the six games, the seven games, 90 minutes, but you're away with uh, this squad for like six weeks. So you have to find kind of a lot of time to spend your time, like create memories, create moments and kind of create that team togetherness. But I don't think pictures ever got out, actually, but there was one night when I remember we were going to dinner and I said, um, in a couple of days' time, let's draw a name out of the hat and you have to dress your teammate for dinner. And, oh, my God, there was some outfits. Like, we put a bit of a budget on it. So I was dressed as, like, an old woman, obviously being the grandma of the team. I think Tooney was dressed as this big red lobster just walking to dinner and, like... But it just showed, like, we wanted to have fun. We were having fun anyway, but, yeah, just creating their memories off the pitch. So I did joke on Instagram that I might share some of my camera roll from that tournament at some point. So, yeah, maybe if work dries up, I'll have to share some photos. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, you made the decision that you were going to retire. Was it kind of like 
a grieving process in a way to go through such a huge change. I've kind of, you know what, I've I've felt okay. I have surprised myself. I have felt okay. But then I think at the same time, I have been very, very busy since retirement. So I do um, I do speak to someone just about um, kind of that change, really, because even though you feel okay, I think sometimes we'll wait until things hit us to then try and fix it. And I do know that my life's gone through this massive change and I do worry that maybe it'll hit us a little bit further down the line when I'm not as busy. So... I do try and say to people, if you can, if you've got access to it, speak to people when things are good as well, because your mental health is so important. But yeah, I, I do feel good at the minute. Um, and as I say, maybe because I just feel so grateful for the opportunities that I've had throughout my career. How do you think football helped you become mentally strong? And have there been some turning points in you really finding your mental strength? Uh, I think football makes you mentally strong because at times you just you have to be you take so many defeats sometimes you go through this journey where like you'll win you'll win trophies you'll win a medal and then the next week you could lose the next game so I think you have to be mentally strong in order to survive but I will touch on that that in my early years I thought I was mentally strong because I was like no one can ever see when I'm upset I'll I'll never show that I'm sad in front of my teammates. I'll I'll never do that. And then what I realised when I got older was the strongest players were the ones that could show them emotions. So I think in my early days I probably wasn't that mentally strong because I used to hide a lot of emotions and I'd be scared to show them. But what I love about the game now is I feel like this is a safe space where people can see if they're struggling. Like you have to think you've got girls say out here who are the young age of like 20, 21, and they're mm. representing their country on the world stage. Like if people say pressure doesn't come with that, then they've never played sport before. So I think it's important that we check in with people and that also the person feels like they can say how they're feeling without it meaning it's going to have a negative response. So yeah, I think as I got older, I learned to share my feelings, which I think made us a, a stronger person. Do you think mental health has become less of a taboo in sport? I think people definitely speak about it more now, definitely. Like, we used to get messages when we were younger and it was like, don't show disappointment in your face if you're not playing. And it was like, so you were like crying inside and you were just walking around smiling like this. But it was like, it wasn't reflecting how you were feeling inside. So I think people have shared Mm. the stories. There's been some athletes over the years which have shared stories just about probably going through tough times in the careers and then if something happens to you you go oh well wait a minute that player went through this or that player went through that and I think that's why it's so important that athletes do share the stories but yeah mental health is so important if you're not happy in your head then you're not going to be playing your best football you're not going to be performing in your work life and I think we all know as humans that we have to take care of our mental health and with that sometimes comes the responsibility of actually speaking out if you are struggling. It's such an amazing moment for women's football right now. It's like an all-time high. It's breaking records in ticket sales. Viewership is like through the roof across the world. But there's no denying there are some huge challenges still ahead for us to get proper gender equality in sport. And Football players yeah. across the board are always regularly told to stick to football, but in the women's game, that is really not an option. Looking at women's sport and women's football right now, what do you think are the biggest challenges we've still got to face? Yeah, I think obviously there is that equality side, but I always try and get away from the direct comparisons. It's it's two different games, men and women's football. Obviously, there's a lot of lot of gender differences, but I always try and look at the positives, like... When I look at my career, I, I said when I was 18, 19, which I'm sure my age now, but it was about 18 years ago, I would never have dreamt of having a full-time job as a footballer at a club like Manchester City, Chelsea, Arsenal. I never would have thought there'd be 90,000 people going to Wembley um, for a Euros final. So I think there has been a lot of positive change along the way. Do we keep needing to push it? Of course we do, of course we do. Like straight after the Euros, um, I know Lotta and Leah led the way on, on the campaign to get girls equal access to football in PE. 
because that's where I fell in love with football and if you're not giving them access to football, you may be denying 50% of girls' potential dreams of being a footballer. So it starts there and then at the other end, the clubs need to keep pushing as well. Like We need to keep getting the games in the main, not the men's stadiums. And because people, once you put the game there, you're getting 50,000 to Arsenal v Chelsea, you're getting 50,000 to Man City, Man United. So when people tell us that mm. people don't want to watch the game, I'm like, it never disappoints when it's given the opportunity. Mm. But that opportunity needs to be made available more regular, in my opinion. I was also reading this story about when you started playing as a kid and you won Man of the Match at the boys' tournament when you were yeah, like yeah. seven <laughs> years old and you were saying that the organizers were absolutely fuming about it and then the next year you were told you couldn't play for that team anymore when you look back at your career now has sexism been something that's really punctuated your career and have there been some moments of sexism that really stuck with you or fueled you forward to be the player you are i was younger I, i took quite a lot as a kid to be honest i used to get kicked a lot parents would shout at me all the time like kick that girl and I'd be left in tears on the pitch on numerous occasions at the age of eight and nine when I was 12 a boy broke my elbow on my first day of senior school just because he was calling his names for playing football and I went to stick up for myself he tripped us over and I I smashed my elbow in about three places so yeah there's there's always been tough moments along the way but would I change any of my journey? Yeah, I'd love not to have had the broken elbow, but I think them moments kind of made me stronger. And I'm also kind of proud of myself that I try to stick up for myself as well. And you know what? The the most pleasing thing now is like, there'll be a, a young Jill having her first day at senior school who plays football and she's not going to get tripped up and she's not going to spend that first day in hospital. She's going to spend that first day playing football and it's going to be accepted and that's what means the most to us sometimes you can't change what happens to you but then you can just make it better for the next generation and that's what means the most to me that's so special and I think as a female footballer in a world that hasn't always necessarily made space for your dreams how did you always maintain your self-belief in those circumstances I just loved it. I just like, I do actually feel like I was put on this earth to play football. I know that sounds so deep, but like there was nothing when I, when I look back uh, along the way, like Jill, you can't play football anymore. There's no teams. Um, maybe you'll have to go and play netball or something like that. Um, whenever there was like an obstacle put in my way, there was no way I wasn't going to play football. It, it was always my priority. It, it always has been. And, Maybe like family and friends have have had to kind of sacrifice a lot of probably not getting my like full time or full attention um, because of the love of football. But it was what I always wanted to do. And I feel like that's been my purpose in life. So, yeah, I think there was just it's, it's really weird to say, but whenever anybody took away that opportunity I was even more determined to do it. One of the things that's definitely changed in women's sport is because I was reading when you first played for a professional club at Sunderland the team didn't even have their own kit and you got the hand-me-downs from the men's team and it was kind of like a free-for-all like you just had to grab the kit and run. Like now we're in a situation where not only do women have their own kit specifically designed by Nike for instance they now have period conscious blue shorts instead of white and leap protection shorts and all these things that women have been crying out for so long in sportswear. Can you believe we finally got to this moment when you think back to your journey that you've been on with Kit? No, definitely not. Even like women's boots, like stuff like that. It's mad. And when you speak about like periods, obviously that's something that's probably a good example. When you speak about the mental health side, it's something that you didn't feel confident talking about. But you would be Mm. very conscious if you were wearing like white shorts, you would be. And I remember even some games going, are we in white shorts today? And the tellers, it was like black shorts or blue shorts. And it'd literally be like a sigh of relief like oh it's one less thing and you don't want to be worrying about that you've got enough going into the game and it's like just by changing the color of the shorts you can ease the pressure even more on performance so yeah I think it's absolutely amazing as I say like I look back on them days and 
the sense of belonging just because we had we all had the same kit on yeah okay it was 50 sizes too big for us it was all washed out red that had turned pink but I looked around and the fact that we were all in the same kit and um, just meant so much so now the fact that they've got women's uh, fitted kit and you know what you go out there putting on that England shirt obviously seeing the Nike taken you just feel like important like you're like my kit fits I'm ready I look good I'm gonna play mm. good that is so important and I think one of the things I love about women's football is it, it is a space where everyone feels like they belong. And being yeah. a gay man, I never thought that sport was really a space for me. Female football has really become a space where everyone is welcome and they can turn up, they yeah. can scream, I can be my camp self, I can shake my phone finger around and everyone is so understanding of everyone. Do you think football has given you a space to truly be yourself as well and really take pride in your identity yeah definitely I feel like it's just never been any judgment really when you talk about the sense of having a partner some people have boyfriends some people have girlfriends and it's just like that's just how it was really and yeah I think that's kind of one thing that I always feel fortunate about and yeah people always say like oh but do you do you want to tell your story and all this and I'm like there's not really a story. It's just the fact that whoever you fall in love with, you fall in love with. And I hope that young people um, who play sport, they feel like they can be themselves. Because, again, when you talk about the pressures of playing in high-pressurised environment, if you can't sit next to your teammate and maybe share a story that happened at home or something like that, and you're kind of scared to say that you've got a girlfriend or you've got a boyfriend, then that's also playing on your mind as well. So, yeah, I do feel very grateful to football that I've I've always been able to be myself. Um there's never been any question about it. Uh football's always been very supportive to my family and it's crazy because it's almost like you're thankful for that. But really why can't we be ourselves when when I look at people in the world and I think if you have an opinion on someone because maybe the gay I'm like what is going on with your own lives that that's what I think and I think mm. as long as we can just keep teaching kids to be themselves if I'm fortunate enough to go on and have a son or a daughter I would really hope that they just feel like they can be themselves be happy in their own head and to feel comfortable with that and you know what if they can be I feel like that would be the the biggest tick box as a parent and it's so special when you can find that space to truly be yourself isn't it yeah, and don't get us wrong, there's been times like kind of where you feel like you had to hide things and you, you had, you're in conversations and you're thinking, oh, don't ask us this question, don't ask us this question. And it's horrible, it like eats you up inside. And when I spoke earlier about like what you use your energy on in life, there's so much stuff going on in the world and you think you don't want to be using up energy thinking, oh, I, I don't want to be asked this question in, in case I have to tell them that my partner's a female or something like that. So, yeah, I think it's, I feel very, like, kind of fortunate in a way that I've been able just to live my life. But I hope by kind of sharing my kind of pictures on Instagram or a little bit about my family life um, and just being open about who I am, I feel like if I can kind of help the next generation with that, then um, it'll definitely be worthwhile as well. There's one thing I need to know. Out of the England team right now, who would you most like to see get in that jungle and eat a kangaroo penis? Oh, that's actually a good question. You know what? Beth England really wants to do it. She really wants to do it. So I'm like, I do think she would be good. I also think Georgia Stanway would be good in there as well because I feel like she'd just give everything at all. So yeah, I'm putting them two forward. Mm -hmm. 